So I'm Ralph Izzo, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of PSEG. Give our viewers a sense of uh, what your company does, um, what's the portfolio, who do you provide service to? Sure. So we provide electricity to a little over 2 million customers in New Jersey, and we provide natural gas to a little bit under 2 million customers in New Jersey. And in addition to that, we have about 12,000 megawatts of power plants in the Mid-Atlantic Northeast region. And tell me about how clean your portfolio is today, how clean it will be 2030, 2050. Yeah, so clean is our middle name. We have a portfolio of power plants that are producing a little bit more than half of their electricity from nuclear plants, about a third of its electricity from natural gas, and the remaining about 10% or so from coal. And that coal is a declining fraction of our portfolio. Uh, we have been uh, building natural gas plants and solar farms primarily in terms of our new output, but equally important is we have been improving the performance of our nuclear plants so that they're producing more electricity every day. So tell me about that. I mean, nuclear is stalled in many places. A lot of people are sort of more aggressively going after solar and wind, which isn't a big part of your portfolio. Make your case. Well, I think if you look at nuclear from the point of view of its air emissions profile, and its impact on climate change, in particular being a carbon-free source of energy. By and large, it is the second cheapest form of carbon mitigation that we have available to us. The absolute cheapest form of carbon mitigation is something that very few people talk about, but it is our number one item, and that would be energy efficiency. It's actually not using electricity. Because that's not a very sexy technology, is it? It really isn't, and unfortunately, it suffers from that. We're always so impressed by the latest, greatest wind farm and the greatest uh, solar farm. And really, the most efficient way to minimize carbon emissions is through energy efficiency. And we as a nation are very inefficient users of electricity and natural gas. There's so much more we can do. Are you guys prepared or have already made a pledge to get to a specific clean generation percentage by 2050, as some of your competitors have done so. Yes, we have pledged to reduce our carbon emissions by, I think it's 15 million tons in the next five years. It's important to note that, I don't mean to cast aspersions, but many people who have pledged to reduce their carbon emissions are starting from a high carbon footprint. We are arguably number two or number three in the lowest carbon footprint in the nation already as measured by total tons of carbon emitted, or even by tons per megawatt hour of power output. So we're already starting from a very clean position. And that's largely the result of our nuclear fleet. But yes, we have made pledges to reduce that further. Do you think the industry will make it? It's hard for you to, you don't run all the yeah, companies, I know. So it depends on what you mean by we'll make it. I do think that the industry will get progressively cleaner. I worry about talking about percentage reductions when you start at a very high level and then uh, candidly us being challenged on our lower percentage reduction but we start at a lower level and i genuinely think that what we should be talking about is how can we get energy consumption lower so let me just give you a specific example if i am a hundred percent fossil fuels but i've reduced my energy demand by 50 or 60 percent that might be a lot better than being 80% renewables, but not having touched energy demand. So the real question is, how much carbon are you emitting into the atmosphere and in, and in the process meeting the needs of customers? So I agree with that last paper 100%. I mean, the, the ultimate number here is how much carbon gets emitted into right. the atmosphere. That determines how quickly we warm up the planet. Do you think the uh, power generation utility industry is going to reduce its total carbon footprint in time to avoid the worst ravages of climate change? No, sadly, I think that absent a federal mandate and an international protocol that we all agree to, that is something that is at great risk of not happening. I think that right now what you have is a hodgepodge of state renewable portfolio standards that are easy to achieve as you ramp up. As the cost of realizing these things becomes more obvious, you're gonna to start to see that we're doing these things very inefficiently, that there are places that have a tremendous amount of a natural resource, whether it's wind or sun, and other places that don't. And doing this on a state-by-state -state basis and not simply letting the market decide what's the optimal way to do it by putting a price on carbon that's a national price on carbon, I think we're going to have a suboptimal system that as we start to climb that penetration level, will begin to run into some serious obstacles, and I worry about that. Tell me about uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, obviously deeply affected 
people in your state, in New Jersey. Scientists believe that Hurricane Sandy and hurricanes like it are made significantly worse by climate change. Your product makes climate change worse. What is the feeling inside your company when an event like Sandy happens? Are they, what's, what are their emotional reactions? So I think that there's two reactions. The number one reaction is candidly the short-term reaction, that we can't have customers without power for, in some cases, minutes, and in other cases, weeks, right? So if you have a medical device, and then you can't be without power for minutes. If you have a teenager at home, you can't be without power for weeks. And, and we literally heard that feedback from customers. Uh, so, so reliability and getting the system restored. But then the recognition at these extreme weather events, and candidly, we have not had a second Sandy. But I don't know how many people realize that the polar vortex is credited by scientists to be a result of climate change, right? That as you have a warming of the polar ice caps, you have a change in the air circulation currents uh, in the extreme parts of the planet. And that has allowed for this surge of cold air to coming down into the more highly populated parts of the planet, namely the, the, the middle of America. Uh, so, so we think of Sandy rather routinely as the kind of intense storm that results from climate change. But I don't know how many people realize that even these polar vortices and these cyclone bombs are the result of the changing climate patterns that we have. So our employees then say, we need to do something about it. Now, number one response at the risk of sounding like a broken record has been, why can't we do more in the way of energy efficiency? I'm trying to get a sense of what's, what it's like in the shop. Do we, what's the emotional feeling? Do people feel, oh my God, we're, it's suddenly clear that we've been outputting something that's toxic to this planet? Well, I think that there's been a recognition that we didn't know what we were doing early on. But, I mean, our employees can speak for themselves. They're proud of the fact that we've retired coal plants. We've retired oil burning units. We've built 400 megawatts of solar farms. We have been strong champions of preserving the nuclear fleet. We've invested $400 million in energy efficiency and are asking to invest another $2.5 billion in energy efficiency. There's no shortage of times when I have people coming up to me and saying, both employees and customers say, it's odd that you're championing selling less of your product. And my answer is my product isn't electricity or natural gas. My product is making you, allowing you to live the life that you want to live and providing the infrastructure that enables you to do that. In some cases, that might be a power plant. In other cases, it's more efficient light bulbs. So there is, a, there is a pride around PSEG on being the type of company that recognizes the reality of climate change, recognizes the tremendous imperfections in the current regulatory system and the current public policy arena that is going to jeopardize our ability to achieve those endpoints. What do you say to your consumers on the other side of this who don't believe climate change is real and might be angered that you're making investments that they feel might be unnecessary, might impact their bills. Uh, what do you say to those folks who are still your customers? So with those folks, we say, well, how about the following? If we can invest in energy efficiency, uh, if I'm right, then we've got a double win. I've saved the environment and I've lowered your bill. If you're right, we just have a single win. I've lowered your bill. Isn't that something that we should do? And that's a pretty easy sell with our customers. I see why that's an easy sell, but I feel a little bit like in each one of these examples, you're kind of putting the onus back on, your, on the consumer. Uh, instead of us moving to solar, we're going to ask consumers to use less energy. Oh, no, I'm not going to put the... I apologize if I, mis, uh, if I miscommunicated the, who's that responsible is going to be. I want to come in and do that for you. So today, you trust me to build a reliable grid and you allow me to invest in transformers, wires, meters, and a variety of technology that's on my side of the meter so that you can use electricity in your home to feel comfortable, be able to see at night, etc. I'm saying impose a burden on me to go into those appliances in your home. I'm not talking about your household refrigerator because that's something that maybe you like Stainless steel versus black or whatever the case is. You're not going into my fridge. You're not no, raining not the going, fridge. I'm not raining fridge. Right, but let me check. go into your basement. Let me go into your heating system, your air conditioning system. And to the extent that you put a certain window shade, a light lampshade, let me go underneath that lampshade and put certain light bulbs. Let me put a thermostat in your house that allows you to live as comfortably as you live today, but yet reduces your demand by in some cases 5, 10, and in some cases 20 and greater percentage. And that's not the only thing we should do. We should continue to invest in the clean solar and clean 
uh, wind and preserve that nuclear fleet. But let's start with uh, getting down to as little usage as we need. If you look at any measure of energy intensity, whether it's BTUs or kilowatt hours used per dollar of gross domestic product or per capita or per square foot of developed land, the United States is an energy hog. And we can do a lot better in that regard without putting the burden on the consumer. I'm saying put the burden on us as a company to help customers do that. I want to give you a chance to make your pitch on nuclear. I know you're a strong proponent of it. Scientifically, it's the background you come from. A lot of people are just very terrified of the potential of accidents. Right. So what's your pitch? Why is nuclear the safe way for us to actually uh, reduce car carbon footprint? And more importantly, or maybe as importantly, can you get it done in time? Yeah, so if you look at the existing nuclear fleet and you look at the U domestic U.S. nuclear fleet operations, it is, if not the safest, it is one of the safest industries that we've ever uh, seen operate in this country. You compare it to any kind of fossil fuel extraction, you compare it to any kind of industrial process, you compare it to any kind of commercial process. Uh, you are safer in a nuclear plant than you are working in an office building, just given slips, trips, and falls uh, over file cabinets and things of that nature. Now, I recognize high-level radioactive waste is something the nation has to grapple with, but I would offer to you that that has been more of a political obstacle than it's been an engineering or scientific obstacle. Then I look at what it takes to keep nuclear plants operating. And in New Jersey, for example, the cost of keeping nuclear plants economically viable is $10 per megawatt hour. That translates into a carbon price of about $17 per ton of carbon. If you look at what we pay for solar technology nowadays, solar energy in New Jersey translates into a price of not $17 per ton of carbon, but over $400 per ton of carbon. Uh, offshore wind in other states will, that, they've, that have uh, been embraced translate into prices of two and $300 per ton of carbon. So to preserve nuclear viability is the cheapest way to preserve and avoid the emission of an additional ton of carbon. That example has come home in blatant terms, in very visible terms, in New Jersey in the past three months. We have seen a nuclear plant retire in New Jersey in October of last year. And if you look at November, December, and January of 18 into 19, and I just haven't seen the February data yet, and you compare that to what was the comparable period when that plant was running, all of that nuclear power has been replaced by fossil fuels and the resultant increase in carbon emissions. So, so to watch the current nuclear fleet retire and, and not pay the very modest compared to renewables, sums that is, is necessary to keep them economic, I think is, is penny wise and pound foolish. You're comparing two things, if I understand it. The cost of keeping the current fleet active versus the cost of creating new renewable facilities, not the cost of bringing new nuclear power online. That's correct. So oftentimes people make the, the sadly mistaken argument, well, if we shut that nuclear plant, we'll just replace it with solar. And our response is, well, setting aside the, the engineering and practicality of that, because you have a base load unit, something that runs around the clock, with something that can only be operated when the sun is shining, to keep the existing nuclear plant online, you have to pay $10 per megawatt hour more than the cost of electricity. In New Jersey today, to operate a solar uh, facility, you have to pay $220 per megawatt hour more than the cost of uh, electricity. And in each case, you're basically avoiding half a ton of carbon, which is how I got those carbon prices. So, so the thought that you can inexpensively replace what is producing 90% of the carbon-free energy in the state with renewables is just a, a terrible, terribly wrong assumption. Fair. Although I think where most people would be going is, um, you know, can we replace coal and natural gas with renewables? And, and the answer is, if you're solely focused on carbon at any price, uh, the answer is yes. But if you have a certain perspective on what carbon is worth, I kind of believe the National Academy of Science is saying that the social cost of carbon is a number like $40 per ton, then you're going to have a hard time competing against natural gas when it's a new gas plant. You're going to have an easier time competing against old gas plants. Uh, and I'm not as familiar with coal economics. There it's going to be easier because coal is more carbon intensive. I want to take a different direction for a second. I know you guys have been very, uh, in your particular, out front on this climate issue. The lobbying group for your industry, the EEI, perhaps not so. You know, more recently, I think, have had a, 
a shift more towards messaging about climate change, but they certainly spent a couple of decades with messaging that fought climate change. And as recently as 2017, um, the head of that organization was essentially talking about climate denial on national television. You guys are part of that organization. You support it. What do you think about your participation in it? Where do you stand now? Yeah, well, like any industry, it's never 100% homogeneous. And we worked hard within EEI during the early years of the Obama administration to get EEI to support a cap and trade system, which was complicated, but if we had had it in place now for these past 10 years, we would have made even more progress on carbon. Uh, so the industry does have people who come from states where there's a strong fossil fuel industry. I don't have that baggage, if you will. I don't have that, that issue to contend with. I'm in a state that's highly progressive about the environment, that has a lot of nuclear power already in it. So in fairness to my colleagues, I have the luxury of being able to argue in favor of these progressive policies and at the same time be consistent with my asset base. Now, I would like to take some credit for our company and our, our management team and our investors because we have continued to invest along those ways, as I said a moment ago, in energy efficiency and in solar. So I think that if you walk away from the table, uh, an industry table like EEI, you sacrifice the ability to influence it and bring it along. I think EEI has gotten much better nowadays about arguing in favor of energy efficiency, cleaning up the supply stack, and then taking that more improved efficient system and that improved clean system, and then further electrifying the economy. Because let's face it, uh, nowadays, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the number one source of carbon emissions is transportation. So uh, if we can electrify transportation, there's an opportunity for us there. Take me to the future. What is the biggest obstacle for your company and your industry to keep us from getting to two degrees hotter on this planet? Yeah, there's, there's no question in my mind. There's two major obstacles. Number one is the absence of a price on carbon. If we could only get a realistic price on, on carbon that is ubiquitous, then we would have efficient asset uh, allocation decisions and we would, we would uh, achieve the outcome we desire. I prefer doing that through a cap and trade system because a cap and trade system says this is how much carbon we can afford. Now let the market and the creativity that's embedded in it determine the price for that. Some people argue that's administratively complicated. It's difficult to impose. We don't know what that number will be. So we'd rather set a carbon tax and then let the the carbon reductions be what they are. That makes me a little nervous because I trust the science to tell me what the carbon reductions need to be. But nonetheless, I think a carbon tax is better than no system at all. And the second most important thing is to say to the utility industry, everything you've spent on the generation and the delivery of energy should now be directed towards the efficient use of it. And, and, and unfetter us, allow us to provide universal access to energy efficiency investments on a part of customers so that we help them lower their bill and make as much of an economic return on that light bulb as we did on that transmission wire. All right, last question, open mic. Anything you want our viewers to know that I didn't ask you about? The, the, the recognition that time is slipping away and that the carbon emissions that we are putting out there today will have a thermal inertia, they'll have a chemical inertia, that doesn't allow us to simply turn the faucet off and then reap the benefits of turning that faucet off. In fact, we will have to live with these challenges for years to come. Really heightens the urgency of taking action now. It's a great point. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for sitting down with us. I appreciate it. My pleasure.